a video on this or I'll leave it up just so I can see you guys and interact with it. I'm assuming yeah. this will just be audio. Um, it'll basically be audio, but there'll be a little video too. I think you have to cool. leave the video cool. on for it to pull the audio feed properly. Anyway, cool. welcome to Redneck Live. I think that's what we're <laughs> calling it. <laughs> All right, on deck tonight, we got Mr. Kim, uh, Mr. Pranka, hello, and Mr. Chris Palmer. Hola. Guys, what do we have to talk about tonight? So we have the, all of us have, well, with the exception of Mr. Kim, all of us have had our Instagram accounts fucked with. Yeah, uh, that's been the, uh, you know, the current theme, right, is, I know, I know I've called, called a bunch of people out, right, in terms of questioning techniques and welcomed everybody to have live discussions about it. And that is a thing that is not prevalent in the tactical community is guys wanting to discuss something uh, live, which is very weird to me. <laughs> it's not weird. You know, it's not weird. <laughs> you know why it happens exactly. Now, you know, I know why it happens, but then there's obviously, you know, I think with the uh, the accounts getting banned, it started to uh, become an issue for some people in terms of affecting their business. But the way that I see it, if, you're, if your business is kind of built around some half truths or things that you've that you've said and then call it but when you call those things out or somebody else calls them out uh that somehow is like a toxic trait toxic yes. which i We're all which i don't here. it's all the it's all the same all these alpha male guys these big former you know professional veterans out there can't have a live discussion without their feelings getting hurt to where the and I assume they're all kind of like pro Second Amendment guys, pro First Amendment guys. But the easy button is, hey, let's pay a company to ban us. If that's what happened, it's, it looks like it is. Yeah. Yeah. If it is what happened. You're right. But I'm, I'm what still confusing what I had to do with any of that shit. <laughs> I think it's guilt by I association. I have no idea why. I think so. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where it, I mean, where it comes from. I, the only, the only thing I got, you know, I sent out a text message to a guy. I was like, Hey, do you have anything to do with my IG being taken down? And like five hours later, my IG was back up. So it was interesting. And you're not shadow banned. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think I am. I mean, when I when you, I don't even know how you tell if you're shadow banned. Well, your account's easily searchable. Yeah, and it looks like your yeah, content's right getting good top, interaction. Does not. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, I think a lot of that too, right? That's what pushes. Hey, we'll shift this podcast over to uh, to YouTube and your existing RSS feed, and I think it'll be a better solution. For getting it out there yeah of course of course much better so let, i know a lot of guys who actually prefer it the ability to listen to you guys just because they listen to it in their cars and ig is pretty much impossible to do that with so i know there's a lot of dudes that are going to be stoked for you guys to be able to do this yeah well it should be good well okay so the other big discussion last week on instagram was the uh, connection to the rifle discussion I think Lucas got in a lot of trouble. I don't know why, but he got a lot of blowback for saying some pretty sensible things about placing the stock of your rifle firmly into your shoulder and then trying to hold it there. Yeah, so I think that obviously that is a counterpoint to what a lot of companies are putting out and they do it under, they're saying, well, it's, in context, when you do this, you do this thing in CQB and that the stock in and out. I don't think anything that Lucas said was was off base or anything like that. But I think it goes back to that, right? Lucas has put in a ton of time to develop himself as a shooter. He runs a pretty successful 
holster company, you know, from a business standpoint, he owns a shit ton of guns and people don't like him for whatever he's skinny, skinny jeans. Right. I heard all the, all the comments from the normal cast of characters, right. Whether it's the, the tactical trainer that has no fucking pedigree whatsoever, no background or the professional veteran dudes that are all taking a stab at him where I don't see the connection to the gun thing as being as controversial as it is for some people. No, I mean, there was a bunch of guys talking about this. Yeah. I, is it because I think people took. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. No, I think my take on it standing from the outside watching it's like people took it as by saying you have you should connect to the gun. It's a better, more accurate way to shoot because you're going to be in control of it, and your dot is going to be your weapon system is going to be everything that you're doing is going to be repeatable and it's going to be consistent. It's going to be predictable. By putting it over your shoulder, they're saying like it's like you're saying well you can't do that. And almost like just by saying, hey, this is a better way, you're saying their way is shit. And in reality, that other way is ineffective and it's not necessary. It's it's wasted movement. But you're just saying one way is better and it got transformed into that way is dumb. Even though it is dumb, it's almost like saying the sky is blue is offensive because it's robin egg blue to some people. Make any sense? No, I think it does. I think the... The argument, I mean, I think it showed a lot of people's um, like insecurities. I think that would be a good way to describe it, how they how they felt like because Lucas Lucas put that out. A lot of videos were made and about, hey, this is bullshit where I, I don't think you can't you cannot advocate like having the gun in a very st- having a very stable and solid connection to the rifle is going to allow you to shoot the gun more aggressively. What do you think, Ben? Well, it comes it, it, well, I mean, it doesn't even make sense. It's like the primary thing you focus on when it comes to like building your mount, you know? It's like that firm connection that doesn't change while you're shooting. Like it doesn't even make sense to to say that that you'd want to shoot with the rifle like up over your shoulder. Right. No. I mean, I I think we're all we're all on the same page. Like our, the discussion about it, it's what I would envision if you get some of these guys out here that that are that are promoting, hey, I have the gun above my shoulder. Right. They they try to layer all of this context under it. And when they do that, it's almost like you're saying, so you're telling me, right, the, the easy answer is they all go to a CQB type thing with, with moving through a doorway. So if it's context-based and you have to do this, when you go through the doorway, are you not going to have to shoot aggressively and fast and, and accurately? Right? Well, it's, like it's, a, it's the same as with your handgun. You'd say like, well, I can hit stuff sort of, if I'm not, if I don't have two hands on the gun or if my posture is messed up or if I can't see the sights, depending on what I'm doing, I can sort of hit stuff, right? But like that would never be what I'm trying to do. That was, that's not like best practices for how to use a handgun, you know? Well, you know, I agree with it's a, But it's the it's same the sort of discussion, what, right? Yeah, but it's, it's supposing what the engagement is. So it's a fantasy movement to get through a doorway that you're you're supposing this person's three feet in front of you but that same doorway and hallways and commercial businesses i've been in you think goes into an office goes into a 40 yard long conference room so now you're hitting that same corner and at 40 yards you have to deal and then that's where the argument was well then i would shoulder the stock now it's too late just have the damn thing in your shoulder going through the doorway so you can shoot fast at two yards and you can shoot fast at 20 yards so while you're supposing well, if it's here, I can hit this guy at three yards, and if he's further away, then I would mount the stock. That's to me is it's making the the argument ag- against itself right in its face. Any movement that isn't required is inefficient, a waste of time. That's how I look at it. 
Yeah, if I just I leave don't... the damn gun on my shoulder, I'm good. No, I think it is. I think there's a, there's a lot of things though that that leads into discussions about that become very nuanced talking points from a training standpoint. Like coming in right there, I understand like for guys training in CQB right when you your primary sector of fire for the one and two man starts in the corners, the hidden corners that you don't see. So the mentality of get your gun up in the corner quick, quick, quick is reinforcing where your sector of fire starts. Right. Yeah. When in reality, what you could see, you know, from a percentage standpoint, how many times do you see guys hiding in that shallow corner? I've never found that guy. You know, found kids I've seen it. There. I've seen it, you know, a couple times uh, from the mill side. One time, actual like ambush type practice, a guy there and ends up shooting right at the doorway and and killing the guy that came into the, to the doorway. But that's one out of, from my experience, you know, a significant number of of hits that I've seen that in, you know. So I think it happens where guys will start talking. They start making these very definitive statements, right? They always and never. You always have to do this. You always have to do it. Well, you always want to do it, but sometimes there's things that happen that, you know, maybe as you step through being ready to fight based off what you see in the room from as soon as it becomes available, you still want to get at least your eyes into that primary corner, right? And the muzzle's trending that way, but your eyes can clear much faster than you could move the gun, right? And then that starts, that's not a good way, I don't think, start training initially because it's very nuanced right we want guys to understand the principles getting the gun up into the corner is is where your sector of fire starts and then it's easy for me evaluating cqb that your gun and your eyes are connected and that shows me what you scan right and i think that becomes a trainingism rather than an actual practice well, that's where it came it's the schoolhouse the the, the can or the, the corner target is there so they can ensure you're hitting it you have to hit it with your muzzle so the guys in the catwalk can see that you did it and they can watch the room unfold now they can see it from an instructor point of view and i think it has value maybe in the very beginning but then it has to i think you have to quickly move past it and with experience it just happens that's at least that's been my experience you just know what you need to be looking for in a room and my muzzle does not have a camera in it I've seen everything with my yeah. eyeballs faster than I can move my gun. Yeah. No, I, I think, think it's too. I think in, it's interesting to talk about, like, the, for, for example, the first shot firing, let's say, on a certain distance target. What, what gets the bullet accurate shot on the target is not the fact that if the butt stock was on your waist or butt stock on your shoulder or butt stock on your cheek. It's the muzzle. The, the time it takes for you to fire the first shot, like I said, it's, it's not the time it takes for you to mount the gun on the shoulder or put it on your cheek. In competition, when I shoot rifles, the very first shot is determined by how my left hand, which is grabbing the handguard, how soon I point that handguard, which is you know where the barrel's pointed at, that's what the first shot determines, if that makes sense. So you can still take the first shot whenever that muzzle was aligned to the target as you are working the butt stock onto the shoulder. It doesn't matter if you were putting it on your cheek or shoulder. It really matters how you steer the gun with the handguard and just point that muzzle to the target as soon as possible as you're working the way around the butt stock putting on the shoulder. It it doesn't really matter. What, What matters is the fact that you are putting the muzzle to the target. So in terms of time and accuracy, the very first shot wise, it doesn't matter if it's going to butt stock going to the chick or butt stock going to the butt stock. As long as you fire the first shot when that handguard hand or handguard grip points on the target. But what matters so, is the follow up shots. If you're putting that butt so stock what, on the shoulders, yeah. mount it properly, the follow up yeah. shots yeah. going to be awesome shots. Okay. Yeah. So, Swantik, in terms of accountability, right, so you're shooting, let's say you're shooting a match that you want to win, whatever, mm-hmm. with, let's say it's PCC, right, PCC yeah. Nationals, you're, you're, you're winning your first shot, let's say it's a 10-yard partial target, 
mm-hmm. right? Are you going to, it's, you, you need to hit the head of the target at 10 yards. Are you going to take that shot with, with not a good mount, good connection to the gun? Are you going to take it as soon as the handguard is pointed towards the target? Oh, if the shot difficulty is difficult, as soon as that optic aligns to my eye, it doesn't matter if my bus stock arrived on my cheek or my shoulder. As soon as I saw the color red on the head, that's when I'm breaking. So in that case, uh, typically on the first shot, oftentimes I shoot it during the bus stop getting onto the shoulder, if that makes sense. So I, I really care about how fast I get the optic to my eye line rather than how fast I actually mount it, if that makes sense. Yeah, but with so so with the optic up at your eye line and and the butt stock not in your shoulder, you feel comfortable taking a ten yard shot. Yes. With that, I understand. I understand what you're saying is the gun's moving into your shoulder, and I think yes. in terms of of accountability and maybe how well practiced the guy is, could you become good at that? Probably you could be. Right? Absolutely. In terms. Of, but now, is would that, you do it on a swinger? And if you hit a no shoot, it was an immediate match DQ. I well, I don't like it for two two three personally. Like that's with the nine mil PCC, which is a lot different. Because I find like if I don't have the connection on the first shot, it's tough to get it. Subsequent to that, you know, and if I just wait a tenth of a second for the stock to be firm in my shoulder from the same position, you know. I'm better yeah. off to start shooting then, especially if there's more targets to engage from right there, if there's a lot to shoot. Yeah, and that's about an accurate statement. It takes about 0. 0.10th tenth of a second. Yeah, it's yeah. like a tenth of a second difference. Yeah. And for, like, the 9 mil wouldn't destabilize me that much, but, like, if that first one's out of my shoulder with the with the rifle, it's like, fuck, fuck this. Hmm. Uh, I had an yeah. experimentation with uh, rifle champion Max Lee Grandes multiple time national champion with PCC. So we were going on just the first shot at 10 yard open target. And he was consistently getting 0.5 seconds uh, from bus stock on the belt position after the buzzer. So it doesn't take too much. I mean, we're counting 0.2 seconds as a reaction time. So actual time it takes is 0.3 seconds from the belt to actual firm pressure, uh, p- proper mounting, 0.3 seconds for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think for a 10-yard target, when I start measuring things from any start position, right right around 7 tenths is kind of what I establish as like a goal for most people, right? Now, the problem is if as soon as you change target difficulty for 99% of the shooters and it's not an open target at 7 or 10 yards, you start adding exponential amounts of time when you're not connected to the gun. Right. So from a high ready, like a high port, the gun is, you know, what from the competitive world, the the buttstock is on the belt and you're pushing the gun up to your shoulder, right, to an A zone for for single shot. Uh, you know, five tenths, seven tenths. Yeah, I, that's completely doable as su- for a lot of shooters. Not Max Leo Grandis, not guys that are practicing all the time. You add four more shots to that, that number changes, it doubles, right? Because yeah. if, you, if you're going to ask him to shoot an aggressive bills drill at 10 yards, right, they're going to make sure that the start position is as perfect or near perfect as it can be, or the end position is going to be completely fucked up, right? Yep. And that's, that's the challenge in training is now, if I'm just shooting the one round, I want that one round reaction, right, where I can yep. react at 10 yards with the gun in my shoulder and four tenths, right? But can I, do I feel comfortable reacting to that amount of visual information at that speed to put five more rounds behind that four tenth reaction, right? It's a Most very people, different story when, when it becomes five shots, for sure. <laughs> it is a very That's different story. Absolutely. And then it also is a very different story when we're translating this performance-based skill into shooting people, right? Into actually working with that gun where the shooting part is just it's the afterthought after all of these other things happen right so i think what we're saying what i advocate for is 
connect, staying connected to the gun and having that connection be as durable as it can be in those situations is going to be the benefit. Right now, if you go, if you go back to the distances I like to train rifle at, right, and you can with Max give even Max's tricked out race guns, right? He is not going to shoot, you know, sub two tenth splits at forty yards without being completely connected to that gun yeah. the best way possible with Absolutely. the buttstock in the shoulder and your hand connected to the front. And that becomes the argument <coughs> where it's like, can you get away with can you get away with it at CQB distances, three, five, and seven yards? Yes. But you can also get away with everything at three, five, and seven yards with a fucking rifle. You can do anything you want. And you can be as fucked up from a foundational standpoint, right? And, and guys that, that law enforcement and military that specialize in CQB typically will train CQB at three, five, and seven yards. But if you watch what they do, with a Sims gun and then take that to live fire, that's completely different. You move them back to 20 yards, it changes everything for them in terms of performance. So the way that that I'm kind of advocating this connection to the gun is we start at 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 yards, shooting the pace that we shoot at 10, seven and five. And that's where you'll start to see the value of being connected to the gun is it's 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 above everything else. It's almost to where it's like it's not debatable. I think a question but, I would that, have for you guys, Quantic, would be like if you if you didn't have a hard piece of cover or a lean or something to get around where you are manipulating the gun, would you prefer it start in your shoulder and mounted? Like that's preferable. Oh, absolutely, right? absolutely. So that's but, I think that's my point with it is people are breaking that connection for a perceived advantage that I don't believe is there. I think you can maintain that connection as long as possible, even moving around strange objects. And if it's such a tight, confined space to enter, and it might be time in the, in the LE and mill world to transition to a handgun. It might be time to even try to think of a different way to do it. If you have to become so disconnected to shove your waist through a tight space, maybe it is the time to go to a different gun. Maybe it is time to rethink how you're moving. But I think that's my point of it is, if I can be connected to the gun, I wanna be connected until the very last moment I don't have to be, and then I want to get it hooked back up as soon as possible, especially with the, the some of the targets that you might engage and the way they're going to move and the way that people are going to move in between you and the target. And if a miss is going into people behind that person, like that connection, even for that first shot, is going to turn into multiple shots on many occasions. So I think we have to plan for that. For me, the difference between shooting the rifle properly, when I say properly connected, and not connect to the rifle properly, the difference is just way too big. Uh, yeah, I will, like, when I'm trying to shoot properly with good performance, I'm always shooting connected. I'm pretty much never gonna shoot not properly connected, unless it's just one single shot kind of bet with somebody. Then I may consider just pulling the trigger. I don't care if I was connected or not, just as soon as I see the red dot, if it's just one shot. But of course, the follow-up shots will be just sporadic, uh, not controlled, just not performing right. Yeah. Hey, Ben, your experience, right? You've been shooting a lot of, you know, kind of predictive and, and kind of faster pace, reactive stuff at distance. Like, how are you seeing, like, from, you, from what you've been shooting lately, when you articulate connection to the rifle, where do you where are you emphasizing the connection at? Um, I feel like like hunching up my shoulder, so I feel like it opens up that pocket, so I can get my you know like hunch up, so I can have a spot for the stock, and then pushing in hard enough with my support hand that I never feel like that connection is getting upset. And then my everything else, like my firing hand, my firing arm is just about holding the stock in place. That's kind of how I think about it. Like I'm not trying to do anything except for just help the stock stay there. You know, I'm not trying to torque on the gun or upset it. Yeah. And let's see, if the if the dot's not behaving nicely, 
usually the problem is I need to lean into that hunch in my shoulder. So like a little bit more forward weight bias is helpful. Like when I'm just shooting an A2 hider at like 25, 30 yards, but I'm shooting fast, like leaning in a little more helps. Yeah, I think what I notice the biggest issue that I have isn't really like what I feel in my shoulder pocket. It all comes from the input that I'm putting into the gun with the support hand. Right, because just like for me, let me ask you this, if you experience the same thing, if you if you're trying to shoot more and more aggressive, you know, in a more aggressive way. Right. So doubles or say bills bills at 20 30 yards right and you want the dot to behave very uh very consistent very predictable good dot tracking pattern that what i find is is my left hand will relax and my right hand tenses where it should be reversed right and then i notice that in terms of my connection to the rifle how it feels in my shoulder loosens and it, it's the it's the cue, like the tactile cue. Hey, that support hand is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Not like the buttstock shifted or anything like that. I'm just not pulling it in at the same force that I was when the string started. Yes, I have that, or I have starting to want to influence the gun sideways. Although I do this a lot less now. Um, I make sure my elbow's down, so I'm putting the force straight back and maybe a little bit down on my stock, um, but I used to want to pull the rifle sideways with my support end. That was that huge really for mitigated me. that a lot. And I was messing with my face. My stupid face was messing the gun up. I don't know if you guys have had that experience. I sent you that picture of those. I was trying to shoot doubles at 50 and it was more like reactive, um, but like I was putting input into the gun with my jawbone. Like I was lifting it up and shouldering it into here, but I was putting pressure on it with my face. And I noticed that that was making the, the muzzle end a lot more uncontrollable. Then, and then I start trying to fix it with my support hand. And I noticed, I'm like, stop fucking moving your hand, which meant I have to get my damn face off the gun. Like I could have it attached, but I couldn't be applying pressure and like trying to counteract what my shoulder was doing. I just had to allow it to come up into my face, but I felt like I was pushing on it. And then as the muzzle got stupid, I'm now trying to fix the dot going dot focus and I'm hucking rounds off the target. When I didn't do that and I was relaxed, it would just pop, pop right onto the target. Yeah. What have you guys seen if, um, so like I always tell people double, you know, shooting predictive shooting with a rifle, right? As like a training tool to start fixing issues with the mount, not necessarily the way that I'm going to shoot targets at that distance. Right, but what have you guys learned from stressing the connection to the rifle? What does that do for like your reactive shooting pace where you're reacting to every single sight picture? Oh, it makes it way faster, way faster. And I notice issues way quicker with my mount where it's like, so we've been doing a lot of pistol stuff and it's like, I can run through the same scenario with rifle quick the distances are closer, but the swings are big. You know, the, it's it's a little bit tougher to maintain the connection when I'm swinging around more. So I notice that sort of stuff, whereas before I wouldn't necessarily, you know. So I'm shooting way, way yeah. tighter, even at close ranges. And so talk about that. Like, I think it's, I think a lot of people um, at closer ranges, when you talk about like CQB distance, Right. If, so let's just use the USPSA metric target. They consider, oh, well, that's two alphas. I think you have to pay attention if you're at three, five, and seven yards at where those alphas are. Like, how close are they together? Well, I think the USPSA target doesn't do a very good job of measuring how accurate you can shoot that gun and how fast you can. And it also doesn't do a good job of punishing not understanding offset. Like the A zone is like 11 inches tall. So that just doesn't, if you don't understand offset, you don't get punished. Yeah. 
I know a lot of guys will will only focus on the upper part of the eighth, like they cut it in half. Right, that's one thing, but that's essentially then just not a USPSA target anymore. No, I agree with you, and I think where you'll see it, what I've seen in training with LE guys, uh, you know, specific CQB, they do sims on paper, and even with sims, there's no recoil at all, right? So you would think that we should have rounds right on top of each other. And what you end up finding is guys shooting this really, really aggressive way because the recoil's gone, but still with no connection to the gun, no visual discipline, hitting photographic targets, like two-dimensional photographic shoot, no-shoot targets that have very, very small scorable zones, right? Because it's a miniature version of a person. You find the groups are just, you see, you know, shots not a five outside of the scorable zone, what you would want, you know, on the, the representation of the body where you want the bullet to go, as well as off target misses and completely off paper misses at those distances. Yeah, that's not real good. And I think, no, it's not, it's not at all. But I think that's, you take that back to the live fire part and, and how people are shooting, right? Understand if you shoot a USPSA metric target, or a, a VTAC target, which has the A zone, that zone is ridiculously big, right? From a training standpoint, when there's no pressure, there's nothing, just getting them into the A zone isn't enough. You have to pay attention to what kind of groups you're shooting within that A zone. You think, Chris, from the LE side, is that too heavy of an ask for cops? For the accuracy part and in training doing CPB yeah. runs, no, it's not too heavy of an ass. Um, the immediate effect it has on everything is everything gets much slower. So the speed and pace that guys want to hit houses and go through doors and everything's unlocked and lights on, the overall tempo of the training, the movement is at light speed on sims when all you have to do is make noise on the paper. And if you say, you know, hey, this is your target, if you hit anything outside of that, you're fired and you lose, you're fired from the team and you lose a month's pay. It's just going to slow everything in the house down because now the accuracy standards there. So separating those two, does that even make sense? Like everything's going to slow down because it's all about like, I got to hit that thing right there. And then it's over confirmation and all the other, the, the other pitfalls that go along with it, those all track along too. No, I think it, I think over confirmation is a big thing. So you tie that in, right? We got to start somewhere. And I think it starts, if I want to shoot looser levels of confirmation with the same results, I have to have a very, very solid connection to the rifle and then an understanding of reacting to a lot less information in terms of aiming. But they got to be able to do it on the yeah. range first, let alone the house. I don't know why, like, I think you said it before, why we separate those two things makes no sense. All you did was, now there's a wall here, and the, the one you just did it before outside in the range had a barrel. There's no difference in you stepping around and being good on that target and then coming in the house and being sloppy. What's the excuse? Why does it happen? So why does that happen in training? Why do we separate marksmanship, accuracy, and speed in the house? Where does it go out the window? Yeah. I think it's because of the, the primary CQB training for, for law enforcement is SIMS. Is Sims guns on paper. Like, I did not see that from the military side when all of our CQB, you know, at the unit was all live fire. Right? It was all 70 grain rounds, photographic targets, the pace. It, it had to be the pace you shoot on the range. That's what you bring into the house. That's what, that's what the country asks of you. That's what everybody's asking of you in terms of performance is to be this high performance shooter and then just applying that very high performance shooting to different situations. But it's the approach to training, right? Where the range is, is real shooting. And then you go to CQB, guys are just playing paintball in there. I think it comes, some of that goes into those positional things we see with the rifle, where you can look right over the top of the gun that's canted sideways. You could look right over it and watch the paint rounds go where you want them to go. So maybe that's part, not, I don't like training scars, but maybe that's a little bit of where it comes from. I can look over this and hit my lamp, pop, 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 pop. And you see it when they have GoPros in the corner. The guys are not actually aiming. They're looking right over the top yeah. of the gun. 
I will I tell you, there's there's times in a shoot house when the lighting conditions are right, where you're shooting that many grain rounds, where you can see them going from your barrel to the target. Oh yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. I think from the sim standpoint, I think you've got to be way more disciplined in how they conduct that type of training. I mean, that's a whole nother discussion outside of just being connected to the gun, though. Yeah. What do you got, Ben? Well, we could move on. Next topic. Mr. Yep. Mr. Kim you... and I have been doing some head-to-head training. Mm-hmm. We've done this, Matt. How's it? Yes. It's not, it's not fun, is it, Kim? I've been enjoying a lot, actually. Some fucking it's nasty. Enjoying, it's, it's a weird type of enjoyment, I guess. It's like yes. if you like getting beat up. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good way to put it. A uh, weird type of enjoyment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we've been uh, shooting PDPs. So that's Mr. Kim's like primary deal. How long have you been shooting those? Uh, beginning of this year. Oh, and you were on the Q5s before that? Yeah. So I haven't really shot so are you, are a you, lot. Are you completely switched, Kim, to the PDP for competition? You're not shooting the Q5 yeah. steel frame anymore? For for this year at least, uh, but I, I'm not planning on going back to uh, Q5 because the grip is a little small for me, a little short. The PDP full size is yeah. what I like. Yeah. Yeah. What do you, do you see that you're getting an advantage or disadvantage with the lighter gun? Uh, I wouldn't put it as advantage or disadvantage. For me, it's more of a comfort. Uh, of course, grip being or grip fitting my hand better is one thing, but just gun being light, it helps my shoulder get less beat up uh, with the heavier gun pistol. Uh, when I do hours of training, it really tires my shoulder out, uh, my lats, everything pretty much. So it's a little less abusing for practicing, especially dry fire practice. How do you feel like in terms of the recoil? the perceived recoil impulse is it much different visually no difference but in terms of how like the shock is you know delivered to your hands kind of thing there is feeling difference but not a realistic difference on the target because um, oh. one of the drill i made measurement drill like p- one part of the measurement drill is just simply like no shoulder tension just point on a target and then without fighting the recoil at all, just pull the trigger. And then wherever the second shot or the recoil guides the sight, just pull the second shot there. And you can kind of see how much dispersion from the original shot to the second shot. And then as I'm measuring like the 45 ounce steel frame gun versus like 27 ounce plastic gun, the, the difference was very marginal. It's not enough difference to make a difference on the target in my opinion. You see, some people get really wrapped around the axle about the st- the steel frame gun. They need it to be competitive, right? It's a divisional. This is somehow going to level me up in terms of points. Like I don't. From the, I started shooting Shadow Twos again a little bit for training, and I don't notice a significant difference in that between my seventeen or thirty four. Wait, are you talking in terms of just numbers? Or Performance. Like... Yeah, just numbers. Right, but in terms of the like the character of the gun, it's totally different, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The character of it. Um, I mean, I think I, I think I got to shoot it a lot more. It seems like when you do everything correctly, you can get away with a lot more. Yes. I would say when you with yeah when I do belt. everything incorrectly, I get away with a lot more. With the shadows yeah that's what i noticed uh, yeah heavier gun typically it doesn't exaggerate when you make a mistake so like if i have a little bit funky grip uh plastic guns usually will have like double the effect of uh like sporadic pattern of the red dot or the front sight in recoil it, it's a little more exaggerated uh, when things go wrong yeah it's like I can shoot so a Glock did. with a gold dot really, really well, but it's a lot more punitive to me 
Like if my grip's not perfect, like it's a problem. With the shadow, it's like if my grip's not perfect, it's probably not going to be a problem. Yeah, I'm yeah. I think it's a significant difference in shooting a 17 with gold dot is what I primarily shoot, and then shooting, you know, good competition ammo like 124 grain Atlanta arms out of that shadow. Yeah, that it's more like shooting a little Ruger buck marker. 22 caliber yeah. gun i'm shooting 115 grain through mine just because the gun's so heavy anyway i might as well use something faster yeah like so the, the heavier the bullets head -to -head too slow. sorry yeah it yeah no it does feels like you're waiting on it right all right how long so did yes. it take you guys sorry ben go ahead. no you go ahead with what you're gonna say i was gonna ask like so i i have not shot heavy steel DASAs or those guns ever other than at the range playing around and I shot Angus's AO1D he brought it out to the range yeah like you're talking about being forgiving when I plink at targets in front of me but transitioning it over to another target I think you had mentioned this before that was like throwing a boat anchor across the range and I had to like hang yes. on to that damn thing because I just wasn't used to that much mass moving around so it was very weird for me to move that gun but shooting it it's like it doesn't go anywhere. Right. I and then pe it people think that. it's like a cheat code, but it's like harder to draw. It's harder to reload. Oh, yeah. It's harder to transition, but it's easier in the marksmanship way. And typically That's less reliable. Point. It looked pretty though. Less reliable than. Still frame is typically less reliable. That's probably true. Mm -hmm. Just the way it soaks up the recoil. Yeah. Because yeah, typically, it's still, still to steel, too much friction, still to plastic frame. Uh, plastic, I heard, it actually bends a little bit during recoil. Yeah. So it flexes a little, which makes more, I guess, less tight tolerance. So what what head-to-head -head stuff have you guys been focusing on? Uh, just trying so to we did, feelings, yeah, so first day was um, general movement scenarios, like just like a mock stages, which went the way we thought it would. Then it was standard practice set up yesterday, so like El Prez, Blake drills, Bill drills, that sort of stuff, which I thought was good because you haven't mm -hmm. focused a lot on times in training. Yeah, it was a great time. And it was... And it was interesting how, like, getting lazy on that kind of hurt you. Mm -hmm. Like, when you aren't acclimated to what a sub-5 El Presidente feels like anymore, it's hard to do it on demand, mm -hmm. even if you can do it. Yeah. So, hey, Kim, you, mm -hmm. Ben just said you, you, you started not focusing on times and training. What were you, what was your focus in your training before this? Like, how had, how had that changed? Yeah. Yeah, so for me, I had some life happening incident to, uh, so I, I didn't shoot for an entire month. And then uh, when I was getting back, which is like about a month ago, uh, I was struggling right off the bat. Like I felt like uh, uh, I told somebody a bad joke, but the description of that joke was the gun felt strange in my hands because after a month, like no dry fire. Uh, I had one live fire session, like somewhere in, in the middle, but when I came back, it felt kind of foreign. So I was just going step by step. Okay, I'm gonna redress the fundamentals, uh, but not really in a hurrying way. So just casual pace. Okay, trigger control at speed, no timer, and then I did some doubles drill, uh, measurement drill, things like that, and designated target drill, just to get that basics done. So we were talking uh, trigger control, recoil management. And target transition and it was just all i focused in terms of like accuracy because uh i'm i'm about to shoot world championship ipsc and that match is known for a lot of accuracy style so i was just focusing no time uh, i did have a timer just for the starting buzzer but i didn't set any part-time like draw i used to do you know 0 0.7 0 0.8 second part-time kind of thing but i was like okay i'm just gonna forget about speed draw i'm just gonna like figure out the grip back up and then just shooting part. So when I came over here, yeah, it really showed. Mm -hmm. 
in terms I would of agree with speed that. It really showed. Yeah. That a lot of the real aggressive gun handling stuff was just degraded in just that short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the degraded skill is still, in my opinion, not horrible. Like we're talking about instead of a uh, 0.89 second draw, it would be like one to one and a half, well, 1.1. So we're talking about 0.2 to 0.3 seconds degradation. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like it degraded consistency? Like was, were you missing more grips at that speed or was that unchanged? Yeah. That's the exact reason why I backed it down in terms of speed. So it wasn't like I forgot how to move my arms to my eye line within 0.7 seconds. I, I'm, I'm able to do it, but that's the problem regripping process that was a problem so that's where i was taking like 0 0.2 0 0.3 seconds extra to make sure my grip was proper if that makes sense no no it makes complete sense mm -hmm. how long are you guys training like this for 10 days then i'm gonna go shoot rifles with joel for like three days Man, I can just see the anger is just growing in you. <laughs> no, no, seriously, Kim, I'm I'm super happy for you. I Thank hope you, you don't sleep tonight. <laughs> I hope you don't sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow with a headache. <laughs> so standard practice setup, and today we did like a five-inch plate and an eight-inch plate forming the center of a bunch of movement stuff where we had tough transitions between these little steel plates and paper targets and like that processing component where you know you have to know like did i hit those things yes then move then do it again and then move again that kind of thing yeah no man that sounds awesome but i know i have like a love hate relationship with the times i've had to shoot with ben one-on-one -on -one. <laughs> yeah i could see that just like when you think, yeah, I'm doing really good. I'm all tuned up. Yeah, let's go shoot. And then you're like, man, I haven't even, I don't know shit about this game. <laughs> <laughs> this game is stupid. I'll admit it. It's, it is. It's dumb. Yeah. Um, but the PDP, what are, you, what are your thoughts, Matt and Chris? I'm curious. I, to be honest, I haven't... Um, Outside of shooting like a couple of rounds, I think the triggers from the ones I've seen, like the stock triggers are better than the Glock triggers that I put into my guns. Um, yeah. You know, I, I haven't had a lot of time on it. The ones that I've seen, I like on the PDP, the longer right there, there's a longer grip module. Mm -hmm. Isn't there like a 17 round capacity and a 19 round? Yeah. Full size. Capacity one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the full size grip much better i think they did a lot better job on that than the um than the q5 i've gotten comfortable with the gun way faster than i thought i could that's what i've kind of noticed yeah. i would say the I do grip like, angle man. is very average grip angle yeah it's not really offensive at all <laughs> yeah i haven't i know a lot of people man get wrapped around the axis of like the grip angle of a Glock versus other pistols. I didn't see an issue going from like Glock to CZ in terms of like, like, oh, I can't pick the dot up at all. It's not even where I thought it would be. Like a, a couple dry fires, you feel the difference. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to adjust the grip angles. For well, you just experience. said right there, a couple dry fire sessions. Well, most people aren't even going to do that. So <laughs> yeah, I got to do that going from my no, I think Glocks. Oh really? Yeah, just to get back into just need some dry fire and how back it feels. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean I like the. I'm sure eventually I'll buy one and see, shoot it a little bit. I do like. I'm a big fan more and more of polymer guns with metal magazines, mm -hmm. based off of how the magazines jump out of the gun compared to a Glock. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I noticed you playing with Canics or with the PDPs or 
shit, man. Even XDMs, the magazine shoot out of the gun where a Glock, I don't know if it's the how it drops. It just seems really lackadaisical to me. Yeah, I agree with that. Like Vogel used to like lube his mags every match. Oh, really? Yeah, the outside of them. So they'd come out clean. So anyway. Yeah, I don't know about lubing plastic. No, he did it with like a dry lube. Oh, like oh, graphite like or dry. something. Yeah. Yeah. So I heard TD. So Walther and I didn't get along when the the uh, Q5 or whatever it was came out. We didn't allow it at work because um, it has some trigger things that we weren't happy with. And my understanding is they are changing the trigger to still be the very good trigger that it has for shooting, but to change up a little bit of the way it interacts with the sear. Um, for some close quarters fighting type stuff that we were concerned about for contact shots. So that's my understanding is they are working on it. They're actually going to change the trigger again, come up pretty soon. Oh, okay. really? I wonder if that's going to have like a negative um, effect on how it feels. I have no idea. And it might be just an LE version that does that. I have no idea. But my understanding, I was talking to Nick and he said they're, they are working on that trigger. Chris, why are you guys messing up like the best part of that gun? That's not my fault. I just said I, we aren't going to allow it here at work. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I think that's a pretty good place to leave it. I think that was an interesting conversation. I think it was, man. Yeah. I'm going to keep on working on my connection to the rifle. All right. Try not to get banned on the Instagrams. Oh, try not to get me banned on YouTube. How's that sound? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, that's man. a little. That's a little weird. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't listeners, if you have a question or comment, put it down below. If you're just on the audio rip, you got to email it to me.